Hi, I'm Kathy Pantagini. I'm the Deputy Director of Libraries here in Somerville. And alongside me is my coworker, Kevin O'Kelly, who is um, part of our reference staff at the Central Library. And both of us are here today to talk about Banned Books Week, which is the last week of September. It starts on the 25th and it ends um, on Saturday, October 1st. And part of our celebration is going to include an event at the main library, which is at 79 Highland Avenue, between 2 and 4 p.m. on Saturday, where we are inviting people to come and read aloud from their favorite banned book. We also will have examples of books that have been banned or challenged over the years, so you can just pick up a copy of one of those and read it. And um, this is a collaborative effort between the Somerville Public Library and Somerville Community Access Television. So that said, Kevin, I see that you have brought a couple of books today, as I have two, and I thought maybe you could start by talking about what you brought. Okay, well, um, uh, looking over the history of challenges to books in this country, I've found it really remarkable how many times classics uh, books that are just considered like staples of um, schoolwork, mm. books that probably most students find just really boring, have been the subject of challenges. Um, I was shocked to learn that in 1987, students at uh, Baptist College in Charleston, South Carolina, objected to The Great Gatsby being assigned in one of their English classes because of uh, sexual references mm -hmm. and profanity. And honestly, even at, um, at the time it was published, by the standards of the time, the sexual references in Gatsby were really pretty tame. <laughs> Uh, I mean, the closest Fitzgerald gets to being explicit is in uh, is when his narrator Nick Carraway goes into his cousin's house and meets Jordan Baker. I enjoyed looking at her. She was a slender, small-breasted girl with an erect carriage, which she accentuated by throwing her back body backward at the shoulders like a young cadet. Her gray, sun-strained eyes looked back at me with polite reciprocal curiosity out of a wan, charming, discontented face. And that's it? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Um, and there, there's also a reference to one of the characters having a mistress. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, as far as mentioning anything explicit, you know, uh, Jordan Baker's having breasts is about it. Wow. What year was that book published? Uh, Gatsby, 1925. Hmm. <clears throat> when was the challenge or the 1987. Band? Wow, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And um, in 2010, the state of Arizona made headlines when it passed a law prohibiting the teaching in schools of any materials that promoted resentment of a group or class of people. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, the, which the State Department of Education uh, interpreted to mean that they should abolish the Mexican-American Studies program in Arizona high schools because a lot of the history covered, of course, naturally involved Anglo racism mm -hmm. against Latinos. Right. Um, and one of the more interesting side effects of this was um, a high school English teacher was told by his school board that he could not teach The Tempest, which is a Shakespeare play about, uh, in which some of the characters are shipwrecked on an island. And one of them, Prospero, uses his magic powers to control the inhabitants. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the school board asked the teacher, could you teach The Tempest without discussing oppression or colonialism, and he said no. And um, you know, and one of the passages that um, you know that basically best expresses the colonialism inherent in the Tempest is when Prospero 
is talking to this wild creature, Caliban, that's a native of the island that he tried to civilize and now controls. Um, this island's mine by Sycorax, my mother, which thou takes from me. When thou canst first, thou strokest me and made much of me, wouldst give me water with berries in it, and teach me how to name the bigger light and how the less that burn by day and night. And Prospero says, that most lying slave whom stripes may move, not kindness, I have used thee with humane care, and lodged in mine own cell till thou didst seek to violate the honor of my child. And then Prospero's daughter Miranda says, I pitied thee, I took pains to make thee speak. And Caliban replies, you taught my language and my profit on it is I know how to curse. Hmm. Wow. Um, and, you know, it's interesting that, you know, usually when Shakespeare plays are challenged, it's um, ones with like a lot of sexual content, like measure for measure. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is the only time I've ever heard of the uh, Tempest mm. being banned from a classroom. So, and when was the, how long ago, 2005? Uh, the law was passed in 2010. Oh, okay. And then the teacher who wanted to teach the Tempest had that conversation with the school board in 2012. Mm -hmm. And do you know, is it still banned or? Uh, I do not know. Yeah, it's interesting because as I was spending some time trying to figure out what books I was going to pick, you know, there was this thought I had about books that are challenged versus books that are banned. Mm -hmm. And I think I did read somewhere that most often it's that books are challenged right. and not banned. Yeah. Um, more so the case now than yeah. years ago. But um, yeah, so I don't know. We, we come into that, you know, well, I feel like we are lucky because of where we live in the country. Right. And in particular, living in Somerville, I, I have a hard time really thinking about a time I had a book. I mean, I've had people complain about passages of books, mm -hmm. but never anything formal where right. we were asked to consider removing something from right. the collection. Um, but have, has that been your experience too, or? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I have, uh, occasionally parents have called the reference desk and complained about Go Ask Alice. Oh, really? Like yes. re even more recently? A few years ago, yeah. Wow, okay. And um, then uh, there was also a self-published booklet on uh, gentrification called mm -hmm. Buying Other People's Homes mm -hmm. that uh, a patron uh, asked our Glenn, the direct, our director, mm -hmm. to remove from the library. And Glenn said, well, there's a process right. for going through this. You have to file some paperwork and attend meetings. Mm -hmm. And when he found out it would take effort, he backed off. Right, yeah. Hmm, that's interesting. And now, and the book is still available, or the pamphlet. Right. Yeah. And, um, and more years ago than I care to really admit, um, a patron complained about the Harry Potter books. Oh, in the way, and so that they wanted them removed from the library, or just more. Well, he would write inside oh, them. Oh, okay, this yeah. This book is from hell. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think I know who you're talking yes. about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you know, what's funny is with this particular example, the one with, about Harry Potter. It makes me think about the times I've had conversations with patrons who mm -hmm. have objected to certain books and why are they in this part of the yeah. collection. And more often than not, pretty much all the time, I'm kind of glad for the conversation right. um, because in a way it, turned out, it turns out to be an opportunity to talk about why the book is where it is, Absolutely. why we decided to buy the book for the collection. It's mindful, I think, for me, just because it reminds me there is a process about right. why these books show up on our library shelves. And also, uh, people just feel better if they feel they've been heard. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So in a way, you know, it's the nice, I guess, um, what do you call it, like the, the secondary part to it, I guess, right. after the initial, like, shock and awe mm -hmm. of it happening, you know, is the thing, the good that can come out of a conversation like right. that. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. 
Well, I noticed that you have some books here. I do. Um, so Tell me about them. <laughs> well, you know, up until recently, I was in the children's room mm -hmm. um, for 15 years. And I've always, since I started here, I've been involved in children's or teen right. services to, in some capacity. And so I looked through the American Library Association's website and mm -hmm. took a look at the lists of the more recently banned books, yeah. um, or challenged books too, I should say, and grabbed three that uh, were of interest to me. Mm -hmm. And two of them are books that were published more recently, within, within the last 10 years. Um, and then one, that would be the I Am Jazz and, um, and Tango Makes Three. Right. And then I also grabbed um, The Stupid's Die by mm -hmm. um, Harry Allard, the illustrations by James Marshall, um, because we still have them on the shelf and the books are, re this book in particular is very funny and the series is very funny. What I learned about all of them, um, I'll start with the one by Harry Allard. The stupids, you know, it gets challenged primarily from people who feel that the idea of calling somebody stupid is disrespectful. Okay. So it's this um, notion, and it's been challenged across the country, um, but that it shows, you know, it encourages children to be disrespectful, say. Okay. The story is actually, you know, about um, a family who you know, is a bit scatterbrained or lacking in common sense. And so the things they do in the story are the opposite of what you would expect. And if you look through the images, um, you know, there are pictures like there's a clock on the wall, but all the numbers are completely different. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when they go to sleep at night, the family sleeps underneath the bed instead of to on top okay. of the bed, which is where the dog and cat sleep, mm -hmm. you know. And it's about how the dog and cat basically are navigating this nonsense family through their day to day. So in this particular story um, where the stupids die, they think they die because the power goes out in the house and they can't <laughs> see anything. So, but the dog and cat go in the basement and fix it. So, okay. um, and you know, the people who talk about the value of that kind of book will point out that you know, they're very funny books mm -hmm. and, you know, they have great appeal to kids who have a sense of humor. Right. Um, so, and, you know, they have received good reviews over the years from, you know, publications mm -hmm. that we would use for collection development. Yeah. And the book also, uh, by your account, does like reveal an essential truth. Uh, most people who have pets do let them run their lives. <laughs> That's a good point. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and then uh, I guess the next one that I'd like to talk about is the um, Entango Makes Three. It's such a lovely story. It actually is based on a true story. And um, it's about same-sex penguins that um, end up becoming attached to one another. Mm -hmm. It happens all on their own. Yep. And they observe, this is at the zoo at Central Park, what they're <laughs> observing are other penguins who are going through the mating process. And these two who are, have been together for a while are trying to do that too, but they're noticing that they're missing one part of it, which is neither of them can produce an egg mm -hmm. to nurture and hatch. So a zookeeper finds, um, an egg, there was another couple of uh, penguins who had more than one egg and they didn't know how to care for both of them. So the zookeeper took oh, a secondary egg and gave it to okay. this couple. And they ended up doing exactly what the other penguin couples did and created a nest for it mm -hmm. and made sure it was warm. And then when they hatched it, you know, a chick came out and they took care of it. Wow. And yeah, completely fantastic story. The rhythm in it and the ability to be able to read it out loud, it, it's actually a great book to read out loud to classrooms. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you have it at home and you're reading it with your child, it's a great book. It just is gorgeous to read out loud. And the illustrations are really lovely. And the interesting thing about that book is, you know, so because it's a true story, and you and I have talked about this before, you'll get a book sometimes and you're not quite sure where to put it, especially mm -hmm. in the children's room. Right. So the natural draw for a book of this size with these kind of illustrations is 
um, to put it in the picture book room. Right. And that's where it is in our collection. But there are some libraries who actually um, do put it in the nonfiction area, and it might be because they think that's where the better fit is. Okay. But it also um, has been reported that it's because they feel more comfortable with it being there because they think that section gets browsed less than, say, the picture book collection. Aww. So they're not drawing as much attention to it. Yeah. So they're basing it more on the fact part of it than, say, maybe trying to encourage homosexuality and right. that sort of mm -hmm. thing. Um, and then the last book that I brought was I Am Jazz, which is um, a beautiful story about a boy who recognizes from the time that he's very small um, that he really is a girl okay. inside himself. He feels right. that way. And it's basically about how he, um, he feels so strongly about it. I should say she feels so strongly mm -hmm. about it that she tells her parents and when it gets time to go to school um, you know she gets encouraged from her parents to kind of pursue the avenue that you want to pursue right. and you know um, at the same time they're there for the child when say other kids might poke fun at this person right. and maybe a teacher might have something to say mm -hmm. about it but but basically, the path for this particular child is one that's full of support. Um, okay. You know, where both the parents, there's a part in the beginning where they talk to a doctor who kind of recognizes what's going on with the child, which is gender dysphoria, okay. um, and talks about how to encourage uh, the parents, really, to kind of walk the path with okay. the child, which is kind of great. And, you know, it's not all smooth sailing. Sure. You know, there's definitely parts in the book where you know that there might be a bump in the road for this child, but it's how they deal with it okay. that kind of is proactive. And, um, and it is also based on a true story. Okay. I, when I looked it up, um, it seems like the girl um, Jazz Jennings is you know tween age now okay. and I think might even have a reality show of her own but um, uh, this book of course has been challenged uh, because of uh, the idea that it promotes homosexuality which um, it really doesn't no. <laughs> they're just talking about this one particular right. child and um, and you know an unconventional lifestyle yeah. so yeah it's all the typical stuff that I don't know. I feel lucky because I feel like at least around here, people want that. You know, they yeah. want as much diversity in a right. library collection as we can possibly give them. So, you know. Yeah. Um, although, um, you know, back in the day, in the early 20th century, the phrase banned in Boston was kind of a national punchline hmm. because of a local organization called the New England Society for the Suppression of Vice. Mm -hmm. And they frequently objected to uh, books and library collections. And actually, the um, Boston um, Public Library had a vault called the Inferno, where they kept books, where librarians kept books that, um, that some patrons might find unsuitable and even like racy. So, um, so might find it was before they even they just got a book and were like, okay, they're not gonna like this. Exactly, and yeah. Put yeah. it in the vault. So wow. uh, the works of the French novelist Zola were mm -hmm. kept in there. Uh, so was Chaucer mm. and uh, Boccaccio's Decameron. Mm. That's so funny because now I'm also thinking. Do you remember? I remember when I was coming up in library school, or when my, I'm thinking about when Elizabeth McCracken once referred to the both of us as baby librarians when we both mm -hmm. started working yeah. together. Yeah. But, uh, but that many years ago, hearing stories about how librarians would maybe self-censor a little right. bit, mm -hmm. um, this idea that you would get a collection of books up and all the ones that could be objectionable you kept behind the desk, like books about the human body, right. or mm -hmm. um, which was something that was just so obvious to not want to keep doing right. as I was coming up and going to mm -hmm. library school and realizing, you know, you want to make these things accessible. Oh, yeah. But yeah, yeah, it's so funny. Vice, what did, 
the vice stand for? Was it just for racy material or? Uh, it was just sort of an all-purpose um, Was it like euphemism. alcohol too? And uh, alcohol, smoking, yeah. gambling. Like prostitution. It covered the whole, yeah. like all the fun stuff. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, and actually uh, back in the day, like around the time of the New England Suppression Society for the Suppression of Vice's heyday, there was a good bit of hand-wringing among pundits and librarians and government officials as to whether um, the ready availability of fiction was actually good or bad for people. Hmm. Uh, that um, that um, that novels about romance might uh, give young ladies inappropriate ideas. Right. Yeah. Uh, that. Um, that novels with a lot of violence would uh, corrode people's sensibilities. Right, it's so interesting. Yes, it is. Um, it's you know the. Um, I mean, it, it, what it boils down to is that you know, censorship or challenging books is basically about fear. Mm. About fear of the new or. Um, fear of loss of control. Mm. I would. Agree with you. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I also think about it now in terms of um, shifting media. Mm -hmm. You know, this idea that what kids not only read, but what they're seeing on TV, mm -hmm. what games they're playing. Right. Um, and it's it's hard. You know, it's hard to, yeah. when you see all of it as a librarian. You know, you have to remind yourself or at least for me, I have to keep reminding myself of what my role is, right. which is, you know, I'm not the parent. Right. I am the person who works at the library who is making the material available. Mm -hmm. But really those decisions, um, especially when it involves uh, young children, you know, they really do need to be made with the parent. Right. Um, yeah, and you know, hopefully that fear that you're talking about I keep going back to whenever I am able to have a, a conversation with somebody who has that fear mm -hmm. or distrust or and maybe kind of hope that you can broaden horizons right. a little bit and it works both ways. Yes. You know, I've benefited a lot from hearing, you know, when people are upset about things that are happening at the library, you know. Kevin, thank you so much for sharing today. Well, thank you, Kevin. <laughs> And everybody, just a reminder, the Banned Books Readathon is on the grounds of the Central Library Saturday, October the 1st at 2 p.m.? Mm -hmm. 2 okay. to 4, with snacks and hopefully lots of people, yeah. Uh, so bring your favorite outrageous book yeah. and read from it. Yeah, definitely. I'm all for that. Great. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank you.